Good morning. Good morning, MRH. They don't ever really get a shout out. Now, you guys know the gospel, you know the truth that saves, and you know the deceptions that damn. You know the qualities of a true believer. But I want to ask you a question. I want you to think with me. If I brought before you this morning a consistent, characteristic, unrepentant adulterer and asked if the fruit of his life could possibly evidence that he was a Christian and asked you what you thought, you would say, of course not, Johnny. We're not saved by our works, but based on his lifestyle, he does not know the Lord and he will not go to heaven. If I brought before you a characteristic, unrepentant idolater and asked you if his life evidenced that he had saving faith, you would say, of course not, Johnny. The fruit of his life indicates that there was no root of faith. He does not know the Lord, and he will not go to heaven. If I brought before you a man or a woman who is characterized by unrepentant sin, and he or she was a drunkard, And asked if the fruit of his life evidenced that he had saving faith or she had saving faith. You would say, of course not, Johnny. Do not get drunk with wine is a biblical command. And to live in constant violation of that clear command of scripture reveals that saving faith has never taken place in their life. Only God knows the heart, but we can tell that this person does not know God and will not go to heaven. If I brought before you a murderer or a thief, you would say the exact same thing. Because those are disrespected sins. But if I brought before you a gossip, a slanderer, and a reviler, and asked you if the fruit of their life evidenced that they had saving faith, if that was what they were defined by, What would you say? Well, the scripture gives us the answer. 1 Corinthians 6. And we're going to jump around. We'll be in James, but let's look first at 1 Corinthians. I want you to see a theme in the Bible. Verse 9 of 1 Corinthians 6. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves. This is a serious list. Nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. A reviler is a gossip. A reviler is a slanderer. Sandwiched in the list of sexually immoral adulterers, murderers, thieves, and drunkards. You have the uncontrolled tongue. If I ask for you to describe for me a culture that has rejected God and therefore has been given over by God, you would know what to say. Romans 1, Johnny. It says that God gives people over to their lusts, to impurity, to the dishonoring of their members because they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them over to dishonorable passion, men with men, women with women. And then I would say, right so far, continue, go on. And then you would keep on reading and then you would say, well, they did not see fit any longer to acknowledge God. And and then he gave them over to a debased mind. Then I would say, well, what's a debased mind? Well, they do things that ought not to be done. 
with their bodies. But more than that, they are filled with all manners of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit. They are gossips, slanderers, icing on the cake, and haters of God. The sins of the tongue might have your respect, but they are no laughing matter to God. No laughing matter. Proverbs 18.21 says, Life and death are in the power of the tongue. The topic of the tongue in the Bible isn't traced with triviality. It is oozing with significance. Because life and death are in the power of the tongue. So there is life and death significance here. This isn't a topic that you go, Hey, this is for the varsity level Christians. No. God is holy. You know that. And his holiness demands that God is never neutral towards sin. He isn't slightly displeased by sin. God hates sin. And Proverbs 6 gives us a list of things that God hates. Six things God hates. Seven that are an abomination to him. Three of those things have to do with the way you use your tongue. Murderers. Wickedness. Evil people, and then liars, gossips, and slanders. No joking manner to God. If you've studied the book of James, you know that James is dedicated to describing the Christian life as it really is in reality. Many people right now in this gym potentially and many people that you've grown up with or in your church profess Christ, but not many people possess Christ. You can profess Christ, but not many people possess him. That's why Jesus says many will say, Lord, Lord. And James is writing his wisdom literature for you and I, where his primary concern is to show you and I what godly living actually looks like. And he mentions the tongue on every single chapter. He mentions it twice in chapter 1, verses 19 and 26. Chapter 2, verse 12. The majority of chapter 3, where he's going to provide graphic illustration of the disproportional power of the tongue. In chapter 4, verse 11. Chapter 5, verse 12. And he's going to talk a lot about if you really know God... It's going to become manifest in the way that you live. Remember in chapter 2, he says, say it with me, faith without works is dead. We're going to display our faith by our works. And additionally, you know that when James is writing this, he's not writing little numbers at the top of each new line, verse, chapter. Those were added later on for itinerant preachers who were going from town to town on horseback so that people that they were preaching to would be able to navigate the Bible and find where he was preaching from. This is all one letter. And so in chapter 2, at least what we have, James goes immediately from faith without works being dead. If you're really a Christian, I don't care where you go to school. I don't care, and neither does God, the family that you grew up in. He doesn't care where you've served. He says, if you really know God, it's going to be obvious by the way that you live your life. That's chapter 2. And immediately, he is going to transition into the use in chapter 3 of the way that we use our tongue. It is the dipstick of your spiritual condition. Why? Such a strong emphasis on the tongue. 90 times in Proverbs, over and over again throughout the book of James. Well, because James knows, God knows, that the tongue and the mouth don't operate independently of your heart. 
The tongue then is not simply a two ounce boneless muscle behind an army of teeth. The tongue is the monitor of your heart. It takes your spiritual temperature. A faith then, and this is out of love, a faith then that does not transform the tongue is not a saving faith. Go to James 1, 26. He says, If anyone thinks himself to be religious and yet does not bridle his tongue. Let's stop there for a second. He's saying, if anyone thinks that he is religious. Now, this is a real belief. This is for us. He says, if anybody thinks he's religious, this is a person who legitimately thinks that they are Christian. This isn't just someone who believes and affirms some sort of higher deity. Well, there's got to be something out there. No, this is a person who is religious. The only time in the Bible this word is used is right here. This isn't some nominal attender of a church. This is a Bible study leader, mission trip going person, Awana badges, membership classes, Bible teaching, disciple making, religious. This isn't just an opinion they have. This is a firm conviction. They believe themselves to be religious. This is the way they think reality is. They are worshipers in their mind. They dress and act and talk, at least externally to some people, the part. No one is telling them to examine their own life. Because this person truly thinks that they are saved. And then it says, and yet. If anyone thinks himself to be religious, and yet. That's a contrasting statement, right? This is a conjunction. So we're heading into something here. So dial in. This is important. This means, and yet, does not bridle his tongue. This means he can't control or restrain what he says or what he tweets. He is not the master of his tongue. His tongue is the master of him. It says this person deceives not just other people, deceives his own heart. Deception in any form is devastating, right? Have you guys ever been deceived by someone you love? It's tragic. Have you ever been deceived by someone you know personally? Have you ever heard the stories? If you've grown up in the church, you know the tragic stories of deception when people fall and disqualify themselves from ministry. It's heartbreaking. Have you ever been betrayed? Let me tell you this. The most tragic form of deception in the Bible is self-deception. The most tragic deception is self-deception. This person thinks they are religious, but they don't bridle their tongue. So this person's religion is, verse 26, worthless. This person is delusional. The same idea as 1 Corinthians 15. If Christ did not rise from the dead, our faith is in what? Vain. It's futile. Worthless. Zero. Pointless. We are to be pitied. And in the same way, your faith and my faith is absolutely worthless if Jesus is not a risen Savior. The person that does not bridle their tongue, who claims to be religious is deceiving themselves and the faith that they profess is not a faith that they possess. Their faith is useless. There's an earnestness here. 
in my voice because I don't think James is trying to roast people. I think he's genuinely concerned and I think he's issuing a loving warning not to a known hypocrite but to a deceived professor of faith. This person might be you. The question is, why does the tongue, why does it need to be bridled? If our religion is revealed and manifest by the way that we use our tongue, by bridling it, controlling it, restraining it, why does the tongue need to be bridled? Five things. Number one, Because the tongue is restless. The tongue is restless. In verse 8 of chapter 3, it says that no one can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil and full of deadly poison. Now, just to interject here, in verse 1, it says that let many of us not become teachers because we will uh, endure a stricter judgment. For we all stumble in many ways. If one does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to bridle the whole body as well. So everyone is going to stumble in what they say. But the warning here is issued to those who unreservedly and unrepentantly continue to not control their tongue. The tongue is restless. Verse 8 says, it is a restless evil full of deadly poison. The tongue needs to be controlled because statistically you are going to spend one-fifth of your life talking. Every single year, you fill 66 800-page books full of your words. 66 800-page books full of words. The tongue is restless and it is rampant. And that's why Proverbs 10, 19 says, Where there are many words, wrongdoing is unavoidable. If you talk a lot, it's impossible to not sin. But the one who restrains his lips is wise. Maybe this seems too daunting for a chatty Cathy. I'm a talker. I like to talk. But listen to the words of Jesus in Matthew 12. Verse 33. Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad. For the tree is known by its fruit... You brood of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak what is good? For the mouth speaks out of that which fills the heart. The good man brings out his good treasure, what is good. And the evil man brings out of his evil treasure, what is evil. But I tell you that every careless word that people speak, they shall give an accounting for it in the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. You will, think about this. You are going to give an account before a holy God that has no neutral position on anything you've ever done. For every single idle, careless, non-premeditated word you ever have spoken. It causes us to consider the way we speak, right? That's not hyperbole either. Every word. Restless tongues are often the signs, or the sign, of a restless heart. Out of the tongue, out of the heart the mouth speaks. And restless tongues is a sign that many people haven't really rested in Jesus. Introverts aren't off the hook here either because Jesus is talking about a restlessness to talk, to tell others. Romans says that we are like snakes 
with sacks of poison under our tongues and we bite and devour one another. The tongue is restless, but it's more than that. Life and death are in the power of the tongue. So secondly, not only is the tongue restless, the tongue is powerful. When I was growing up in Chicago, in order to kind of like warm up our vocal cords for singing, I don't remember ever being in a singing class, but I just remember learning the song. We sang a song in first grade, Ms. Dolgen, um, and it started... Five nights ago when we were all in bed, bum bum bum, Mrs. O'Leary hung a lantern on the shed, and when the cow kicked it over, she winked her eye and said, it's going to be a hot one in Chi-Town tonight. Bum bum, fire, fire, fire. Four nights ago when we were all in bed, bum bum bum, Mrs. O'Leary hung a lantern on the shed, and when the cow kicked it over, she winked her eye and said, it's going to be a hot one in Chi-Town tonight. Three nights ago, um, (laughs) you get it. The story is about Catherine O'Leary's cow who knocked over a lantern and with a spark, the great Chicago fire broke out. 17,500 buildings burnt to the ground. Hundreds of people burned to death. 125,000 people homeless. $400 million. A couple hundred years ago, billions of dollars today in damage. With one spark. And James says, the tongue is like a fire. Disproportionate damage for something that's only two ounces and hides behind your teeth. It's powerful. Proverbs 16, 27 says, an ungodly man digs up evil and in his lips there is a burning fire. Everything this guy's fiery mouth touches is destroyed. Proverbs 26, verse 20 Where there is no wood, the fire goes out. So where there is no gossiper, strife ceases. Small but mighty, little but wields great force. James is going to use three consecutive illustrations to describe the tongue. He's saying it's like there's a mighty horse and it's controlled by a small bit. You want to control the horse, control the bit in its mouth, like a great and mighty ship. When I graduated from college here, I went overseas for a while, and I was in Norway with some of my buddies, and then we kind of hopped on one of the planes. Once you're in Europe, everything's like 50 bucks to go anywhere you want. We went to Greece, and I wanted to go kind of check out the different islands. My great-grandpa's from Greece, and I was like, I'll go find my family. Hey, it's Johnny, you know, and... uh, Opa, bam, and they start smashing their dishes. Um, they didn't know what that was from. And I got in this big boat, huge, carrying hundreds of people. And I said, can I see the rudder? Show me. I've read the Bible my whole life. I got to see one of these guys. And they go, you can't see it. It's small. And it, it's underwater. but it controls the entire ship. And it's like a fire. It can't be tamed. In Thailand, I've seen elephants paint watercolor pictures with their trunks. And they're amazing. They look like Thomas Kincaid. And James says, we can tame animals Parrots can memorize the Constitution. Tongues can watercolor, or elephants can watercolor, and tongues, if that's the trunk. But no one can tame the tongue. Thirdly, why does the tongue need to be bridled? It's restless, it's powerful, and the tongue, number three, is foul. When the Apostle Paul is characterizing the fallenness of man 
and wants to display all of the ugly features of man's depravity. When he wants to describe wretched, sinful men, here's how he describes them. Romans 3, verse 10. There is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There are none who seek for God. All of them have turned aside. Together they have become useless. Just like the faith of the one who does not bridle their tongue. There is none who does good, not even one. How is that seen, Paul? Verse 13. Their throat is an open grave. With their tongues they keep deceiving. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. He goes on to describe the wretchedness of man by their tongue. The focal point of man's fallenness is then their mouth. Ephesians 4.29 says, Let no unwholesome, no corrupt talk proceed out of our mouth. What's corrupt? What's unwholesome talk? You know, when I was a student here, this isn't really premeditated, so help God. When I was a student here, I, I went into an environment where in order to display your understanding of Christian liberty and the freedom that you had in Christ, in order to be presented as balanced... An understanding of the liberty that God provided in the gospel. It became almost a cool thing to use foul language. And an abnormal thing to still think that was wrong. It's a cultural thing. What's the big deal? Well, the big deal is that God gave you a tongue for a reason. And anything that doesn't build up and give grace is unwholesome, corrupt, and crass, not fitting, not proper, not consistent, and does not fit the character of the Christian, the quality of God. This is gutter speech. Words that people that know God intimately don't use. Here's the reality. In every single culture I've ever been in, words have been invented to describe from a cultural perspective words that are offensive. Words have been invented in every single culture. And the Christian is commanded to not use those words because you are not to be identified with the world. I've never heard of someone who came to know Christ Because they met a guy who was a Christian that also cussed. But I'll tell you what. On Sunday, I met someone who gave their life to the Lord because they were working a construction job. And this guy never cussed. What's different about you, man? You don't cuss. Well, I'm a Christian. Ephesians 5, there must be no filthiness or foolish talk, vulgar joking, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. Some of you laugh at the things that Jesus Christ was slaughtered for. Under the banner of creative innuendo, you laugh and tweet at things that Jesus weeps over. And the tongue and the thumbs with which we type need to be bridled. And then what comes next after Ephesians 5, 4? No filthiness, filthiness, no foolish talk, vulgar joking. What comes next? For this you know with certainty. You can count on this. That no sexually immoral or impure or greedy person which amounts to an idolater has an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. The sexually immoral person in Ephesians 5 is not just the sexually rampant guy that sleeps around. It's the one who doesn't sleep around because it's a big sin 
and yet pacifies his lust and his crassness by the way that he speaks. That person who doesn't do it in real life, but with their tongue and their speech, does not know God. Kind of hard, right? But this is not the reason I'm giving you so much scripture. I ran some of this by uh, an older man I trust. And I said, man, am I off? I've never heard this. It's right here. This is what you guys are at a Bible college for. Because this is in the Bible. No one's perfect. But if this is the way that you repeatedly talk and use your tongue, it's revealing. Number four, the tongue lies. Embellishments, exaggerations, partial truths, full of slander, white lies, they're all here. The tongue lies, and that's why it needs to be bridled. Psalm 34, 13 says, Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking lies. Proverbs 12, 22, Lying lips are an abomination to the Lord. Proverbs 19, 9, A false witness. If you're a liar, you will not go unpunished. And the one who breathes out lies will perish. Psalm 101, verse 7, no one who practices deceit shall dwell in my house. No one who utters lies shall continue before my eyes. One more. Revelation 21, 8. As for the cowardly, listen to a theme in the Bible. I don't like to barrage you with verses. I want you to see something that isn't isolated. Even if it wasn't only one passage in Scripture, pay attention. But when you see something over and over and over again, examine your life. Proverbs t- or Revelation 21.8. Here's the end. We're reaching the end of the Bible. As for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, witchcraft people, idolaters, and all liars. Their portion will be in a lake that burns with fire and sulfur. God hates anything that is not the truth. And I say it that way because I think many Christians are defined by partial truth. God hates anything that is not fully true. And every time you tell a story with an exaggeration or a little bit of an embellishment, that's not lost on God. Every time you tell a lie, the microphone is on and God hears everything. And God hates lies. He hates them. Lastly, fifth, what is it? Well, here is the bio. Who am I? I have no respect for justice. I maim without killing. I break hearts and ruin lives. I am cruel and malicious and gather strength with age. The more I am quoted, the more I am believed. I flourish at every level of society. My victims are helpless. They cannot protect themselves against me because I have no name and I have no face. To track me down is impossible. The harder you try, the more elusive I become. I am nobody's friend. Once I tarnish a reputation, it is never the same. I topple governments and ruin marriages. I destroy careers and cause heartache and sleepless nights. I wreck churches and separate Christians. I spawn suspicion and generate grief, which make innocent people cry on their pillows. Even my name hisses. My name is Gossip. Gossip is a particularly deadly sin. It has destroyed more people, damaged more reputations, 
deteriorated more friendships and divided more churches than any sin I'm aware of. Gossip is told quickly, heard quickly, and spread quickly. It is believed quickly. People confess to immorality, theft, and murder. But I've never had a baptism story. I've been at a church baptism. You know, what's one thing for someone to say, I lived a life of rampant sexuality, and people go, what an awesome story. God saves. I've never seen a young girl get up there and go, my life was defined by serial gossip. God hated it. And people go, God saves. Because we don't view the tongue that seriously. It's respected. Gossip sinks its teeth into hearts, souls, and minds and corrupts faster than a spreading cancer. What is gossip? The word literally means a whisperer. It's a person who talks. Gossip is also sometimes true. It's differentiated than slander. Slander is making things up to destroy reputations. Gossip can be true. And gossip is wicked. Proverbs 16, 28 says, A perverse man, or perverse man, stirs up dissension, and a gossip separates close friends. How is gossip disguised? The porn addict in many ways knows he is guilty. But the gossiper justifies their sin. They cloak it. And they don't know they're in the companion or they're the companion of homosexuals, adulterers, and murderers. How is gossip disguised? Well, gossip in a context like this or in the church is disguised by godly concern. Be praying for Stephanie. I'm not going to say much, but you know. What's wrong with Stephanie? I heard this. What? What's wrong with Stephanie? I just heard this. All I heard from her is that I should be praying for her. Until it ruins people. And God is embarrassed. Gossip is cloaked by requests for prayer. And I would tell you, I hear the most gossip from people that have a high estimation of their own discernment. The people I know that believe they are the most discerning and wise are the people I hear gossip most frequently. Because they have an elevated view of their own perspective. The beginning of foolishness is when you think you are wise. The definition of a fool is that they think they're smart. They get it. They have a handle on life. And they can ascertain other people's spiritual condition. And so the way that they communicate that person's spiritual condition is by saying, I see some things in their life that I've been kind of concerned about. And that is gossip. Your concern, your updates, did you hear dot, dot, dot. The Bible is not, God is not, first of all, God is not indifferent to that. 
And it's not just because he is a righteous judge. It is because he loves you so much that he is never going to be apathetic about the mundane elements of our life. God is not just a righteous judge. He is a loving father. And so the sin that God hates is not only something that he hates, but it's something else. Ephesians 4, we're back. Verse 29. Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment, so that it will give grace to those who hear. There's a conjunction here in many of your Bibles. And connecting the previous statement to what Paul is about to say. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. God not only hates sins of the tongue. God is grieved by them. He's not just a righteous judge. He is a loving father. And your sin grieves him. The reason lies grieve God is because God is a God of what? Truth. God is a God of truth. So he doesn't just hate lies. He's grieved. It's the same word here for when Jesus tells his disciples that he is about to die. The one that they thought was going to set up his kingdom on earth was about to be taken and murdered on a cross. And it says the disciples were deeply distressed. And God is deeply, deeply distressed. By the way that many people use their tongue. He hates lies, but he is grieved by lies because he is a God of truth. He is grieved by foul language because God is a God of holiness. God is also grieved by gossip because God is a God of love. And you cannot be loving someone and gossiping about them simultaneously. Sin is not only what God hates, it is what causes him great grief. So how are we to speak? How do we speak? Well, three things quickly and then two other final thoughts. We are to speak, Ephesians 4, 29, but only such a word that is good for edification. Only, in the Greek, means only. Exclusively. And it's two, three things. Edify the brethren. Speak only words that make souls stronger. Blood-bought people speak the truth in love. Am I off? Oh. I was like, this whole time? Speak the truth in love. This doesn't mean that you don't correct a friend, because faithful are the wounds of a friend. But it's to edify people, to encourage them, to build them up. Secondly, to equip the saints. If you want to train people, equip people, you use your tongue for that method. And thirdly, to evangelize the lost. The great irony here is that Jesus says, the Word of God says, out of our mouth comes blessing and cursing. The greatest tool, one of them, that God has given you is your tongue but it is used in many deadly, destructive, deteriorating ways. How can we do that? How can we do that? Well, this would be an incomplete message if you walked out of here going, watch my tongue, watch my tongue, watch my tongue. We just sang it, and Sam just highlighted it. In order for us to bridle our tongue, 
we so desperately need the power of the gospel. Isaiah 53 says that as a lamb is silent before his shears, so he did not open his mouth. And although being reviled, he did not revile in return. Why was Jesus silent? Jesus was silent because every word by nature that has ever come from your lips is sufficient testimony before a holy God that you and I should be damned for all of eternity. Because we have cursed him, his image, his holiness, and Jesus came to bear the full penalty of the sins of the tongue. He remained silent and bore on the tree all of the sins of our mouth. Everything that God hates was paid for by a silent Jesus Christ. We need the gospel. And and secondly and lastly, we need so desperately the word of God. We need our mouths shut, ears opened, hearts softened, and wills bowed to God's word. Because only God's spirit working through his word will bring mastery of the tongue. I'd ask you to consider that maybe the reason your tongue is uncontrollable is because your mouth has never been shut by a holy God. The people that see God, if you think about Isaiah, he says, woe is me for I am a man of what? Unclean lips. When you see God, you see the filth of your mouth. And so what we need is atonement. We need someone who will pay for the sins of our tongue and give us a new heart. And in that, a new tongue that we can bless God with. And when we stumble, like every man will, we can say, we confess with our mouth our sins, or we confess our sins, and God is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Can I pray for us? And then we have one final song. God, I'm thinking of the song, Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise. There is enough power in the gospel to set us free from the misuse of the tongue. Thinking of the psalmist in Psalm 19, who says, Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, O God. This is a constant prayer. Psalm 141, set a guard over my mouth, God. God, this is what we so desperately need. God, we're thankful for your grace. We, we stumble in many ways. Only the perfect man never stumbles in what he says. But God, the tongue is not a secondary issue to you. And so would it never be a secondary issue to us? We love you, God, and we are dependent upon your grace and your spirit and your word and your people to guide us and help us in conformity to the image of the one who loved us and gave himself for us. We pray this in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. Love you guys.